Few cultures in human history have been studied as much as the ancient Egyptians, but it often feels like the more we study them, the more mysteries we uncover. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that some of the things that have been found in Egypt over the years have changed our understanding of human history. In fact, we put this video together to prove that very point. The Rosetta Stone is an ancient artifact that played a pivotal role in deciphering ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics and significantly advancing our understanding of ancient history. Discovered in 1799 in the Egyptian town of Rosetta during Napoleon Bonaparte's military campaign, the stone is a fragment of a larger steel inscribed with a decree issued by King Ptolemy V in 196 BCE. What makes the Rosetta Stone extraordinary is the presence of the same text written in three different scripts – Ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, Demotic, and Ancient Greek. This linguistic triad allowed scholars, most notably Jean-Francois Champion, to decipher the hieroglyphic script by comparing it to known Greek text. Champollion's groundbreaking work, completed in 1822, unlocked the mysteries of hieroglyphs and provided the key to understanding ancient Egyptian civilization. The Rosetta Stone's impact on our understanding of history cannot be overstated. It opened up access to a vast array of historical documents and inscriptions providing valuable insights into ancient Egyptian culture, religion, language, and history. The decipherment of hieroglyphs enabled the translation of countless ancient Egyptian texts, expanding our knowledge of one of the world's oldest and most fascinating civilizations. Stick shaptis, also known as Stick Ushaptis, were wooden figurines used in ancient Egypt. Unlike the intricately carved and decorated Ushaptis, Stick shaptis have a rough anthropoid shape and bear a single inscription on the front. They lack the artistic detailing seen in other Ushaptis and are left unpainted. These Stick shaptis date back to the end of the 17th dynasty and the beginning of the 18th dynasty, approximately around 1550 BCE. Unlike regular Ushaptis, which were placed in burial chambers to serve the deceased, Stick shaptis were exclusively found in the underground cult chapels of Egyptian tombs, specifically in Thebes. Often they were positioned inside crudely carved model coffins. The inscriptions on these stick shaptis bear the names of important officials, and there's probably a good reason for that. It's commonly believed that stick shaptis represented family members and friends of the deceased. Placing these figurines near the burial site allowed the represented individuals to be symbolically close to their loved ones. These unique artifacts shed light on the intricate customs and deeply held spiritual beliefs surrounding the commemoration of the deceased in ancient Egyptian society. The Scribe's Palette, which can be found within the collection of the Met Museum in New York City, provides a fascinating glimpse into the world of ancient Egyptian scribes during the Middle Kingdom and Second Intermediate Period, dating back to approximately 2030 to 1550 BCE. This wooden palette served as a practical tool for holding ink and brushes. Remarkably, remnants of the black ink can still be seen on the palette, though the red pigment has faded over time. The brushes accompanying the palette were made of reeds with one end frayed to hold the ink. Interestingly, the design of scribal palettes remained largely consistent throughout history, as evident when comparing this Middle Kingdom example to another from the New Kingdom. The continuity of this tool highlights the enduring traditions and techniques employed by Egyptian scribes across different dynasties. Currently on display at the Met Fifth Avenue, the scribe's palette offers a tangible connection to the skilled individuals who meticulously recorded information and preserved knowledge in ancient Egypt. Its presence invites visitors to appreciate the intricate artistry and functional importance of writing in this ancient civilization. In a groundbreaking study, the discovery of a silver bracelet adorning the wrist of Egyptian Queen Hetafiris I from the 4th dynasty has revealed an extensive trade network between ancient Egypt and Greece dating back to 2600 BCE. This finding challenges previous assumptions and provides new insights into the globalized nature of ancient Egypt, even in the early Bronze Age. 
The research, conducted by a team of archaeologists from Australia, France, and the United States, analyzed the silver artifact from ancient Egypt and found that the lead isotope ratios corresponded exclusively to those found in silver originating from the Aegean Islands, Attica, and Anatolia. To put that in layman's terms, it means the bracelet traveled a long way across the world before it ended up on the Queen's wrist. This indicates an ancient trade relationship that was more extensive and much older than previously believed. The study sheds light on the interconnectedness of civilizations through trade and emphasizes the role of silver as a valuable commodity in the ancient world. The research also underscores the limitations of available historical records from the Old Kingdom period, making these ancient artifacts an invaluable source of information about ancient trade networks. Thanks to a renewed focus on archaeology within Egypt, amazing discoveries are made there almost every month. This set of ritualistic tools caught the eye of experts when it was found at Tel Al-Fara in September 2021. And we can see why. The experts believe that the tools were made for religious purposes and were most likely used in rituals dedicated to the great god Hathor. The connection to Hathor comes from a limestone pillar carved into the shape of the goddess, which was discovered at the same time. Tel Alfara is a site that's already known for its religious connections. It was believed to be the home of the goddess Wajit, the protector of Lower Egypt, and was first settled in the pre-dynastic period before briefly being abandoned and then settled again 2,800 years ago. Artifacts dedicated to Hathor have been found at the site before, including clay figurines and incense burners. Egyptologists are enamored with these tools because while we find the bigger signs of Egyptian faith quite regularly, their tombs, temples, and statues, the smaller tokens of their dedication are much rarer discoveries. To find them in such good condition is even rarer. The whole world knows about the most famous of the many artifacts that have been retrieved from within Tutankhamun's tomb. But one of the more curious objects Howard Carter discovered in the tomb was a tiny scarab brooch. It's a beautiful decorative object, but it would be considered a minor detail if it weren't for the material that it's made from. The yellow-brown scarab contains a yellow silica glass stone taken from the sand of the Sahara and then polished by a skilled craftsperson. The glass is about 28 million years old and was created when a comet hit the desert with such force that the sand was heated to a temperature of around 2,000 degrees Celsius, thus forming glass. Fragments of this ancient glass can still be found scattered across 6,000 square miles of the Sahara Desert today. The Egyptians were years ahead of their time when it came to astronomy. So is it possible that they were aware of the extraterrestrial influences that resulted in the creation of this glass? That might be a stretch, but it seems they knew there was something special about it. If they didn't, it wouldn't have become the centerpiece of jewelry made for a king. About 3,500 years ago, an ancient Egyptian game known as Senate served as a means of communication with the dead. Senate was played in Egyptian society for approximately 5,000 years, until it fell out of favor 2,500 years ago. Recently, an expert claims to have found a Senate board from a period when the game took on a more spiritual significance. Originally, the game involved two players competing with five pawns on a grid of 30 squares arranged in three rows of 10. The objective was to move all five pawns to the finish point in the lower right corner using dice rolls. However, over time, Egyptian texts began to describe Senate as a representation of the soul's journey through the realm of the dead. A Senate board housed in the Rosicrucian Egyptian Museum in San Jose, California provides evidence of this evolution, with one square featuring a hieroglyphic symbol for water, representing a lake or river encountered by the soul in the underworld. This discovery showcases a late-stage change in the game's symbolism, making it an important find in the study of ancient Egyptian technologies and beliefs. A British historian, John Taylor, made an exciting discovery while visiting an Australian museum in 2012. He stumbled upon a fragment of papyrus on display at the Queensland Museum's Mummies exhibition that bore the hieroglyphs of Amenhotep, 
a prominent ancient official from the 15th century BCE. Intrigued by the find, Taylor inquired about other fragments in the museum's archives and was led to a conservation lab where he uncovered numerous fragments of the Book of the Dead belonging to this same important historical figure. These fragments, donated by a private citizen in 1913, are rarely displayed but were brought out for the British Museum's Touring Mummies exhibition. Taylor mentioned that similar fragments are scattered across various institutions worldwide. The Australian specimens will be photographed to determine their place in the full scroll, which could be as long as 60 feet. This significant discovery sheds light on the fast-paced antiquities trade of the late 19th century and highlights the existence of undiscovered material still awaiting exploration. Sadly, it also highlights the fact that far too many ancient Egyptian relics have been broken up and shipped to every corner of the planet rather than being kept together. Let's go back to the Met Museum and look at another ancient Egyptian wonder that's held within its enormous collection. The cosmetic box of the royal butler Kemeni, dating back to the Middle Kingdom period in ancient Egypt, somewhere around 1805 BCE, offers a glimpse into the lavish world of the royal court. The exquisite cedar box is adorned with ebony and ivory veneer along with silver mounts, showcasing the high level of craftsmanship during that era. The front of the box features an incised decoration depicting Kemeni, the royal butler, presenting ointment to Amenemhat IV, a pharaoh whose headdress is embellished with two feathers, possibly indicating his deification after death. The lid of the box bears an inlaid inscription containing the names of the king, Kemeni's titles, and a prayer to the god Sobek. Discovered in a pit tomb in Thebes, Upper Egypt during the Carnarvon and Carter excavations in 1910, this cosmetic box provides a tangible connection to the ancient Egyptian royal household. If you want to see it, it's also on display at the Met Fifth Avenue. Archaeologists and engineers in Luxor, Egypt have successfully re-erected a fully restored Karnak obelisk dedicated to Queen Hatshepsut. The obelisk, originally built in 1457 BCE, stands near the Karnak Temple next to a sacred lake. With the bottom two-thirds lost over time, the restoration project used the original top portion combined with a modern reconstruction of the lower aspects. The Egyptian Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities announced the obelisk completion, which measures approximately 36 feet in height and weighs around 99 tons. Carved inscriptions on the obelisk depict Queen Hatshepsut's association with the Egyptian god Amun, reflecting her status as a living god. The restoration initiative in Luxor aims to preserve and restore various ancient Egyptian temples, tombs, and monuments. The fallen obelisk's recovery outside of Wajit Hall and subsequent rediscovery by French archaeologist Georges Legrand led to its relocation near the temple's sacred lake. While the exact dimensions of the original obelisk remain unknown, a standing obelisk at Karnak, measuring nearly 100 feet tall, serves as a point of comparison. This remarkable achievement not only restores an essential piece of ancient Egyptian history, but also showcases the engineering prowess and commitment to preservation in Luxor. The British Museum currently houses a large double statue of the pharaoh Horemheb and his wife Amenia. The artifact was discovered at an unknown time in an unknown place, and the identity of the sitters in the sculpture remained equally unknown for many years. The statue was acquired by the British Museum in 1839 from the Anastasi Collection. The original provenance of the statue was uncertain, with Thebes or Saqqara suggested as possible sites. However, the latter was deemed more likely based on the origins of a group of similar double statues and the areas where Anastasi acquired most of his collection from. The identities of Horemheb and Amenia were confirmed in 2009 when a multinational team of excavators found a missing piece from the statue in Horemheb and Amenia's burial chamber, specifically three clasped hands. A plaster cast was made of the clasped hands was a perfect match for the missing part of the double statue. The statue depicts the husband and wife sitting on a throne with lion's legs, both wearing long tunics and wigs popular in 18th Dynasty Egypt. 
The double statue is unique in that it shows the wife clasping her husband's hand with both of hers. New research suggests that King Tutankhamun may have slept on the first ever version of a modern camping bed. Researchers from Musa Shino University in Tokyo analyzed a small model of the bed from Gebelin, Egypt, and suggest that it was the first ever three part folding camp bed. The bed, discovered by Howard Carter in 1922, was made from four wooden lion legs along with copper alloy drums that bore the majority of the weight. The elaborate wooden leg shape of the bed made folding it no mean feat, but the designers used ingenious hinges over the legs to take the strain off the hinges. Researchers believe that the bed provides insight into King Tut's aspirations as he had a club foot that prevented him from walking without a stick. Despite this, he dreamed of camping and hunting. According to Naoko Nishimoto, one of the researchers who worked on the project, even though the frail young king may have never participated in long-distance or strenuous expeditions, he nevertheless loved the idea of hunting and camping. His camping bed is inherently poetic. The bed was made especially for King Tut, and visible traces of trials and errors show that the artisans involved in the bed's production didn't have any other threefold beds for reference. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications and you'll be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching.